prayed that during, during this time we would still our hearts, that you would put everything out of our minds so that we would understand what is so very, very important to understanding more about who you are. And so Lord, we ask for your help in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we look to the Old Testament, the first part of the scripture, uh, we, find a pro- we find prophecies, many prophecies about the birth of our Lord. And when we turn to the New Testament, we also find that there's prophecies about his birth, and we find people anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. There's angels who proclaim this message about a, uh, a child that is to be born. And you remember, if you look in Luke chapter 1, and Matthew also records some of this, that angels appear to shepherds, and they appear to wise men, they appear to Mary and Joseph, and they're giving information that a child is to be born. But this child, uh, to Mary and Joseph, he says his name is going to be Jesus. He says his name is Emmanuel, which is God with us. And so I want to just look at a couple of these examples, four or five examples, really, that the, the scriptures are telling us as readers that Jesus, this one that is born in a manger, is God. Okay, so example number one is Zechariah. You remember Zechariah was married to Elizabeth, uh, uh, who was a relative of Mary, and Zechariah is a priest in chapter one, and that's kind of how Luke opens his uh, his letter here to Theophilus to say, look, there's one, there's a there's a priest, and he has been told that that his son is going to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. And so that's uh, in chapter one of Luke, Zechariah, under the power of the Holy Spirit, he writes and tells us of the Lord's salvation. That is to come in verse 76 and 77. The, exa- the second example I want to show you is Mary, the mother of Jesus, is told by Gabriel, uh, the angel there, in verse 32. He says that he will be great and the son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will <laughs> reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so what Luke is telling us uh, uh, through this uh, story to Mary, or this interaction with Mary from the angel, is that Jesus is God, none other than Almighty God. The, the third example that we have is Joseph, and he is visited in a dream by another angel. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so this is Matthew's account, <clears throat> telling us also that Jesus is God. Then after the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to another scene uh, the, when the wise men are uh, come to visit. We went through that last week. Uh, that, and they also proclaim that Jesus is God. And, uh, the example of that there is that they fall on their knees and worship him. They fall down and worship him, and they know that they are worshiping God. Well, another example is Simeon. In Luke chapter 2, our text, uh, just before our text, in verse 29, uh, they, Simeon gives a testimony that the Lord's Christ was sent from heaven. And it says there that his parents were astonished about what was being said about their baby, uh, that is their baby boy, that's a boy that's about to be born. And then also in Luke chapter 2, verse 38, uh, Anna the prophetess would also give testimony that this child was sent by God for the redemption of Israel. And so what all of these people are saying. Uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this, this reco- uh, recognizing that Jesus is not just a, just a, a normal baby, right? But he's Almighty God. He is the Most High. So this e- serves as evidence then for us as we look to the text that this one that's born in the man- manger is the Messiah. He's the promised one that uh, to Israel that is to come, who was virgin conceived. In virgin born, he is the Son of God. Now, this is very, very important that we as students of the Bible understand. It is really called, uh, in theological terms, the doctrine of the sonship of God. And so Jesus being the Son of God, we, we, we want to look to Scripture and see that this is the claim that Scripture makes. In fact, I've heard even this year uh, people say that Jesus never really said he was God. He never claimed equality with God. And apparently they have not read Scripture. Because this is what Scripture says, even in the first couple chapters, uh, uh, recounting the story that Jesus is God of his birth. Many people would go on to proclaim 
uh, that Jesus didn't really realize that he was God until he was about 30 years old. And then one morning he just kind of woke up and, and just really realized that he was the son of God. Then he kind of sort of metamorphosed. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to make that into a verb. He, he metamorphosized. There you go. Uh, into God at some point at the age of 30. Okay. But what the scriptures say in a very, very uh, uh, intentional account by Luke, under the authority of the Holy Spirit, he says that the child knew that he was God. And I want to show that to us this, mor this morning because I believe that it is very important. In fact, this is the only incident that we have that occurs in Jesus' childhood. So I would like for us to look at this this morning and walk through this narrative at least one more time. Uh, I know that the, the, the celebration of Christmas and the, the wrapping and the, the presents and all of that and the meals are over. But Christmas is over, so to speak, on the calendar. But now what? Now what does the scripture tell us about who this child is? So I think this is a very, really, uh, a, a really important part of the story. Because in this story that we're about to read, we have Jesus himself telling us who he is. Okay? So not only do that list of the examples that I gave you, uh, we have Simeon and Anna, Mary, Joseph, the angels, uh, telling us that Jesus is God. But we have in this passage, at the age of 12 years old, Jesus telling us who he really is. Now, this is the only recorded uh, incident from Jesus' birth to the age of 30 years old. Okay, So up until the time that Jesus is 30 years old, this is the only information that we have on him about his life. So if you're a student of the Bible, and if you uh, are... are, are uh, a lover of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to know more about who he is, then this should grip us. It should really get our attention as we look to the one section that covers Jesus' life from birth to 30 years old. So let me give you kind of a timeline of what we're talking about to kind of help in our minds here to hang some thoughts on. As we go through Luke chapter 1 in the Christmas story, if you want to kind of lean on Matthew there as well, we have the registration of the people. So Mary and Joseph, they're living their life in, in uh, Nazareth there, but they're going to come to Jerusalem for some reason or some purpose. And that is the registration of the people or the census so that they can be uh, counted and taxed. And so Mary and Joseph uh, come, and Mary is carrying at this time the Lord Jesus in her womb. They come to Jerusalem and more, more uh, precisely to the city of David, which is Bethlehem, about five or six miles south uh, in that region. So then we have the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. So we know that's the why they came, and then the what is they're there for the census, and then what happens while they're there? The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right after that, in verse 30, 20, uh, 21, rather, uh, Luke chapter 2, eight days later, he is circumcised and given the name that the angel told Mary to give the name, Jesus to the child. So that happens eight days later. That's according to the custom of the Jews, and he was given the name Jesus. Then in verse 22, 40 days from his birth, he was brought to the temple to be presented to the Lord. This was also a custom. So, so right after the birth of the Lord Jesus, they don't just simply go back home. They're there for a while, and we know that because it's several months later that the wise men come to Bethlehem to see the child, okay? Not the baby so much, but the child that's it's several months down the road here at least. But 40 days from his birth, uh, the first eight days of that 40 days, he was taken to the temple. And now they're, they're uh, 40 days later, they bring him into the temple. And that's where they meet Simeon. And that's where they meet Anna. That occurs in verse 22 there, that account. And they, they're marveling at what is uh, talked to him, uh, said about him. As well as the uh, meeting Simeon and Anna, what they were also to do is offer a sacrifice. And unto the Lord, giving them thanks. Most people, uh, uh, the middle class and upper class, would give a lamb or, or, or some kind of animal for, uh, for the sacrifice. But it says in our text that they gave some, some turtle doves, indicating that the wise men had not come yet. Because the turtle doves were an indication that they were of lower class. They were not as wealthy to provide an animal. Uh, and so they gave some turtle doves, which was a code according to the custom of the law, that that would be fine, that they could do that. But if the wise men had come up to this point, they'd have the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. They'd have a, a, the ability to purchase an animal. 
So this is where they see Simeon. This is where they see Anna during this 40-day time of purification in sacrifice to the Lord. Still living in Bethlehem, they are now in a house. And then they are visited by the wise men. Matthew then tells us that Joseph is told in a dream that they should not return uh, back through Jerusalem. In fact, you need to flee to Egypt, and you need to be down there until Herod is dead. What I failed to mention, and what I should have mentioned, someone actually brought it to my attention, is, is this the same Herod that slaughtered the babies? Yes, hundreds of thousands of babies under the age of two. The Herod we talked about the last time was so wicked and so evil that when he realized that the wise men had tricked him and had not come back, he says, well, I'll just take care of this on my own, and I'm going to kill every uh, young male under the age of two. I'm just going to wipe them off the map. And so he slaughtered thousands of two-year-old children and below, seeking to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an obvious act of Satan in his life, but Herod would destroy all the boys under the age of two. The wise men are told this, uh, 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 Mary and Joseph are told this, uh, that, they are, that they should not go back the way of Herod, and so in fact they flee to Egypt for some time, which is also a fulfillment of prophecy that uh, the Old Testament scriptures that says, up out of Egypt will my son come. And so we see Jesus will come back up out of Egypt because he, they fled to Egypt. So after Herod's death, they're told then that they can return back to their home in Nazareth. And that's where we pick up the story. So it's sometime after the birth, about a, a few months uh, after the birth of the Lord Jesus. And I want to give you a little bit of a timeline of his life, okay, as it uh, relates to this text. From birth to 12 years old is... Uh, shown to us in verse 40. So in verse 40, we're going to have uh, this, this gap of about 12 years, or the span of 12 years. Then from verse 41 to 51, cover an incident when he was 12. So you've got one verse, verse 40, covering birth to 12 years old. Then 10 verses or so on, when, uh, on his 12th birthday, you could say, or when he was 12 years old. you got 10 verses explaining what happened when he was 12 years old. Then verse 52 covers from age 12 to 30. Okay, so we're walking down Jesus' life from birth, uh, in verse 40, from birth to 12 years old. When we stop at verse 40, we have uh, th that 12 year gap. Then verse uh, 41 through 51, we have this story that happens or occurs when he's 12 years old. And then another single verse to tell us what happened from, birth, uh, from uh, 12 years old to 30 years old until he begins his public ministry. So this is a snapshot from zero or from birth to 30 years old, okay? It's one picture in, this, in, the, uh, in the life of Jesus. And I think that that helps us get the weight of the importance of this section. So when, I, I want to challenge us to, to not just kind of like when we you know, put your Christmas stuff up and not think about the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth anymore, but think about what happens directly after the Christmas story, okay? So hopefully this week, and uh, uh, as you kind of put your Christmas stuff up, think that just because Christmas is over, it's, it's not the, the, the end of the celebration of Christ, right? There's more to the story. And we celebrate and we worship Jesus all year long, from year to year, faithfulness, year in and year out. So this is a weighty passage for us to look at. So let's begin from birth to 12 in uh, verse 40, okay? So, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So it's a very simple statement that tells us that Jesus grew just like every other child has grown. It says he became strong. So physically, Jesus became stronger as he developed, as he grew. Uh, we know uh, that Joseph was a carpenter, and, and that word carpenter does, does not necessarily mean wood. It can mean metal. It can mean uh, glass. It can mean different things. So he constructed things, uh, and, and so uh, Jesus obviously would have worked alongside his father Joseph in the carpentry business, and, and that's not for the faint of heart, right? It's, it's developed muscles. It developed skill. Uh, so his body developed. He worked alongside of Joseph. He would also walk the the hills there in Nazareth. In fact, there's not a level place if you look at that region to build a house on. Uh, everywhere is hilly, so he would have had endurance. He grew physically and became strong. Uh, and as he grew, we know that he never sinned. And that is very important for us to look at and remember 
as we look at his early life, that as he's growing, as he's maturing, he was without sin. He never had any sin of his own. He also grew intellectually. Uh, notice the, the, the phrase there, filled with wisdom. It really could be read uh, that he was strong physically, but he was strong in wisdom. So as he grew, he became wise. He knew all kinds of information, all kinds of facts, just like you and I as humans uh, develop things. In fact, I, I marvel sometimes when I'm around your, your smaller kids, and I'm, I, it wasn't so long when I was there, and I think, man, you know, it's amazing how many facts and information uh, how much information young kids obtain, they absorb it, they're able to uh, regurgitate it, able to do that back, uh, and, and, and so they're growing, and Jesus would have grown like this also intellectually, uh, physically, but also spiritually, uh, and I believe that it's during this time that he's understanding that he has the mind of God. Uh, Second Corinthians challenges us to have the mind of Christ, which is the mind of God, and so uh, when did this develop? As he's a young child. It's not when all of a sudden he's 30 years old and he said, well, I'm God. I mean, I should start acting like, so I'm going to go on my ministry, right? No. It started at, at a very early age, and, and he himself, we're going to hear from Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in just a, a few moments here. So I believe that the mind of God came on him gradually from birth to 12 years old as he develops physically, as he develops intellectually. He's developing spiritually as well. Then in verse 40, the last sentence there in verse 40 says this, and the favor of God was upon him. In some of your translations, it may say the grace of God was upon him. Now that's interesting, isn't it? When we think about grace, it's for what? Our sins, right? We think of the grace of God or the favor of God upon us for our sin. So what does it mean then when the favor of the grace of God was upon Jesus, he who was without sin? I think it's essentially this. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized in Luke chapter 3, uh, just a couple of pages over in verse 22? Jesus was coming down to the water there, and, and he's baptized by John the Baptist, and Jesus, God says this of Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I think the favor of God or the grace of God was because that he had not sinned, because he was without sin, and he was there already to accomplish his purpose and his will. And he was doing exactly that. That's why the favor and the grace of God was upon him. And that's all it says about his childhood, really. This short sentence that he grew, uh, he grew in favor, he grew in, in the grace of God, and he, he became strong and filled with wisdom. That's the only information that we have up to age 12. Now, when I'm around you and you're around me, what do we talk about? Our kids and our grandkids, right? Our, our, our nieces, our, our nephews. And we talk about the events that are happening that you wouldn't believe the things that they do. Are you really proud? In fact, you may be one of the, the parents that have the bumper sticker that you're so proud that you have a bumper, a blue bumper sticker that says, my child achieved this, right? Well, Jesus also grew just like any other child and young boy, young uh, child that would grow up, but all the while he developed and received more understanding uh, of the wisdom of God. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. Not that he, uh, 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 this word suffered, by the way, there means temptation. Not that he was tempted and failed. Not that he learned obedience from failing. But he learned some things from the temptation or the sufferings that came in his life. He remained sinless and he, oh, he remained obedient to the Father. And he experienced what it was like to obey God. And I believe that that's very important. So he's grown in these ways like the rest of humanity uh, would, but he also uh, but also comes to the age of 12 years old receiving the mind of God, okay? Now, obviously, we know that he spoke with his family. We spoke with, he spoke with his friends. Uh, he was speaking in that time. It's not that he was silent. It's that the scriptures are silent about the account of the things going on in his, on his life. Uh, there's a lot of things that he did that is not recorded in scripture. The things that he said, the, the miracles, uh, the New Testament will also tell us that if, if we had uh, an account or a record of all the things that Jesus did, it would fill up all the books in all the world, right? And so here's a particular instance that I think that, that you can gain some things from silence, right? And one of the things we gain from silence is this remarkable statement or this remarkable account that happens at the age of 12 years old. 
Uh, so Luke is going to take us on a little bit of a trip. He doesn't just come out and say it. He wants us to get the full story of this. So we're going to go on a trip with Luke as he describes this account when Jesus was 12 years old. So from birth to 12 years old, not much going on, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing recorded. From 12 to 30, 18 years later, nothing recorded. But at the age of 12, Luke is going to zero in on this particular incident that I, I want you to really uh, uh, sit up and take notice of what's going on here, okay? So verse 41 says this, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when, they, when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. So 12 years have gone by since Jesus' birth, and each year his parents went to Jerusalem every year, Every year, they've been going back to the Feast of the Passover. Now, Mary and Joseph are very faithful Jews. They are true followers of God, and so they would go to the, fast, uh, the, the Passover feast every year. A Jew was required, a male Jew was required to go to three feasts every year. The Feast of the Passover, the Feast of the Ta uh, Tabernacles, and the Feast of Pentecost. They would go back to Jerusalem and, and observe these feasts every year. And so sometimes they were a day, sometimes they were two or three days, sometimes they were a week or longer, okay? And so every male Jew was required to do this. Now, I want to remind you what the Feast of the Passover was. The Feast of the Passover, uh, and by the way, these Jews could be scattered uh, since they were dispersed, the diasporic, because of hardship, because of suffering. They're, they're not as close to Jerusalem as they once were, right, where they grew up. Now they're kind of living off in Egypt and other places like that. So the trip uh, became a little bit more hard for them, okay? But as the Jews became more scattered, there would be less and less people that would attend these feasts every year. But they would at least try to remember the Feast of the Passover. That's the one that they said, well, the other two, you know, just there's stuff going on in my life. And if, I, if the one that I really want to go to, the one that I feel impressed upon to go to, is the Feast of the Passover. So Mary and Joseph lived about uh, 80 or 90 miles away, and they would make that trip from Nazareth up to Jerusalem, and they would remain uh, faithful, and they would attend, I believe, uh, all three each year. So I want to remember the, 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 the uh, Feast of the Passover for just a moment, because I believe this is what this is Luke setting the stage for us as we see Joseph, uh, Jesus as a 12-year-old boy going with them each year to Jerusalem. And what he sees is remarkable. So to remember the, the, the Passover here, we're remembering that God delivered uh, his people. He provided a rescue for his people. And in Exodus chapter 12, you have this account. And I'll just kind of re help you uh, bring this back to your, memory, or your, your uh, mind this morning. You remember that Israel was taken into captivity, into Egypt, and they were there for 400 years in, in Egypt. Uh, they were taken captive, into captivity by the Egyptians, and they were real slaves. Uh, they, they, they made the bricks, you remember that, with the straw and the mud, and uh, they, you remember that story. Well, God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses, and God says, all right, Moses, it's now time. You need to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And you remember the story, we've got a little song, let my people go, right? And so he says, let my people go, let my people go, let my people go. And so Pharaoh, time after time, does not let them go. And so God says, here's what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to give you uh, ten deadly plagues to, to, that are going to come upon the Egyptians there. And so finally, when they get to the tenth, the, the ninth plague, they have not let them go, right? Pharaoh says, you can go. Oh, just kidding. Come back, you know? And so finally, when they get to the tenth plague, this is the plague uh, that is the, is the um, plague where you're going to have to put the blood on the doorpost. And the angel is going to pass over, and if the blood of the animal is not on the doorpost, then the, the, the angel of death will come through. And if that blood's not there, then the first uh, child, the first male child, the firstborn animal, and the firstborn child will be killed. And so Moses tells the, uh, the Jews here, and this is what they do. And so God says to Moses, the only way then to avoid death is to sacrifice a lamb, Take the blood of that lamb, put it on the doorpost, on the side piece, on the top, on the lintel there, and the angel will pass by you. So that was all a picture uh, of Christ to be the Passover, the sacrificial lamb, that God would take away the sins of the world, uh, who would die for sinners. 
And there was a Passover, a Passover angel. This angel of death would come in the night, and this is what would happen. And as he saw the blood, he would pass by the house. So that was the, the Passover. In fact, that particular night in which that occurred, they would pack their bags, they would be ready to go, uh, they would eat uh, a little bit of the lamb there, and at the moment that God gave the time for Moses to say, let's go, they would, they would get everything together, and they were out the house, no more packing, nothing, it's ready to go. So this was the last play that launched the, Egypt, uh, the Egyptians of the Pharaoh to say, all right, get out of here. All of our firstborn sons are dead. All of our firstborn animals are dead. You get out of here. We don't want any more of you. And so they were gathering then around each year, even after they got into Canaan and in the promised land, they would gather to remember what God did for them in the Passover to set them free from 400 years of captivity and bondage. So that's a, little, uh, a, a brief reminder of the history there. Uh, to get us to understand what it was in Jerusalem when Jesus and Mary and Joseph came into Jerusalem to celebrate what God had done for them a long time ago. So this is the scene. It's instituted by God as a memorial to God, as the Savior of the people, and he is the great deliverer of his people. So they would eat the lamb, and, 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 and they would get out of there quick, and it's, it's, it's all uh, a precursor to Christ. And again, Jesus is there. He's, he's in Jerusalem seeing this, seeing this festival as he comes in as they're celebrating the Passover. So 12 years later, after the birth of Christ, they make the trip, much like they would have done the, the previous 12 years, right? But this time, something different happens. Something different happens. So now we kind of transition to thinking about the Passover to remembering the scene in Jerusalem. So as they would travel in, as Hundreds of thousands of people of pilgrims would come into Jerusalem. First, they had to find some lodging, right? They had to find a place to stay. Most of the time, they would stay with friends or family, or they would try to find anywhere they could to stay. But they would also be trying to find a, to purchase a lamb uh, if they didn't bring one with them. So the place would be bustling. It would be busy. And then they would be trying to find a place to observe the Passover. So it's a very, very busy place. Jerusalem would be swelled by hundreds of thousands of people, pilgrims who would come in. During this time uh, of the celebration and of the sacrificing of the Passover, there would be 250,000 lambs that are slaughtered. Okay, so think about it. It's not just coming into a city that's nice, calm, and quiet. There's people everywhere. They're going around looking for, for lambs to be slaughtered, for their, to, to remember and to take part in this Passover feast. But then think about this. Think about the fact that there's little lambs running around everywhere, and they're not necessarily quiet, right? You have the bleeding of the lambs all over the place. You have people trying to track down a place to stay. You have people trying to track down a place where they're going to eat the meal, and so forth and so on. It's, it's a very busy time as they come into Jerusalem. If there's 250,000 lambs that are slain in the temple, it's probably done by more than just one priest in the temple. There's probably several priests that are, that are slaughtering these animals. And what would happen to the blood of the, all of those animals? It would go out a, a drainage area to the back of the temple, down the back side of the temple, down into the Kidron Brook, turning the Kidron Brook, uh, Brook completely blood red. And so this is the scene. You, you, you have the, the sheep there, the, the lambs there bleeding. Uh, you have the slaughter of lambs in the temple. You have the blood flowing out the back of the temple. You've got the, uh, the brook Kidron turning red with blood. It, it's a remarkable scene, all remembering what God had done for them to release them of 400 years of bondage to the Egyptians. Now, it's very important that you get into the shoes of a 12-year-old boy and walk around and see what's going on. That is not just a 12-year-old boy, but is none other than the Son of God. And he's the Savior. He's the Lamb of God which will be slain. His father Joseph would take the animal. The animal would be killed by the priest. Now we've gone from the, the setting of the scene of the, of the, of the uh, Passover feast, and we kind of come into the city, but let's kind of go into the house a little bit. Inside the house where they would observe, Joseph would take the animal, and they would uh, into the uh, temple first, and the blood of the animal would be sloshed against the altar, and Jesus is watching all of this occur. The blood of the animal would be sloshed against 
hit the altar, and Jesus would see that. Jesus would know at this time that he was the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. We can only imagine the vividness of this picture as it falls on Jesus' eyes. As he's beginning to understand, and I believe as he fully understands, that this is what is going to happen to him. This is representative of what is going to happen to him in 18 years, or 20, 20 years or so. That Jesus would die as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, to take away the sin. He would, be, he would be hanging on a cross outside Jerusalem, shedding his blood as the true and saving lamb of God. The reality that this is in his mind must be overwhelming to him to say the least. So it's very important that we walk around for just a minute in the shoes of Jesus, or maybe as a bystander, or maybe as a family member, to kind of get the sound, the smell, the sight, the things that are going on in the city as Jesus comes as a 12-year-old boy, fully, fully man and fully God. Thousands of people, thousands of sacrifices. The blood was flowing down the street, flowing into the river, and Jesus was subjected to all of this, being 12 years old fully divine, fully aware of what was going on. The family would then take the sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice lamb home, they would eat it, and they would sing, sing hymns, and then the oldest boy in the family would ask a question, and it wasn't really a question for really wanting to know something, he was asking a question to set his dad up. It's kind of like setting a, 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 a baseball up on a tee and say, Dad, here, knock this one out of the park. And he would ask the, the, uh, an intentional question about why this night was different, from all the rest. And then the father would begin to tell the family the story of God's provide God's providence in, in rescuing his people out of Egypt. And back as we look back to our text in Luke 2, verse 43, we begin to see how the plot thickens here a little bit. In verse 43 of Luke chapter 2, and when the feast was ended, now all of this has come to an end, and, and they were returning. <coughs> The boy Jesus, that's returning back to Nazareth, returning home. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Notice there's a difference. He's not the child, right? But now he's a boy. He's grown now. He's not uh, the baby in the manger, but he's grown into a young man. In fact, at age 13, 12 and 13, is the time that the Jews would recognize that this is now an adult, an adult male. So it's, it's between that time. That's very important as we move forward. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Verse 45, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. In those days when they would travel, they would travel in groups of people, uh, pilgrims of people going back. And the way that they would travel is that the children would set, set the pace. They would go up front, and then you'd have the older children that kind of in the middle, then the, then the women, the ladies, and then the men at the back. You say, well, why did they do that? Why did they set, put the men out front? Because of their stride, because of their gait. They would set too quick of a pace, and everybody would get drawn out, of, uh, and their drawers along those roads in those days. So they let the children set the pace so they would be a smaller group. At this time, I believe that Mary assumed that Jesus, being 12 and on the brink of adulthood and manhood, being almost 13 years old, would be back with the men, right? And so she looks around and says, oh, he's, he's back with the men. He's He's got a little mustache coming in, you know, that kind of thing. He's back with the men. He's got his boots on, right? That sort of thing. And Joseph, traveling at, the, traveling at the back of the group, he's probably thinking, well, he's still 12. He still probably is hanging on to being a 12-year-old boy. And so he thinks that he's up there with Mary and the children. And neither one of them communicates to know that he's not there. He's back in Jerusalem. Joseph thinks he's still with Mary. Mary thinks he's with Joseph, and at some point, probably over dinner, when the caravan stops for the day, and by the way, they would travel about 20 to 25 miles on foot a day, and if they got to go 80 to 90 miles back home, it's about a three and three and a half day journey back home. So this is just day one of the trip, right? And so at the end of the trip, they get together and they're going to share a meal, kind of like the, the truck wagon type deal. You know, everybody gathering around, and the families would come together, and they would observe a meal. And so they're looking around, and they've got some of their other kids around, perhaps, and all the other children run around, and they don't spot Jesus anywhere. So they, they realize, we've left him in Jerusalem. And so, verse 46 says, after three days, well, they weren't gone three days, right? It was a day that they were, uh, three days until they find Jesus. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. 
And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So, so three days, that's the time that they leave Jesus, one day out, and then they, they don't leave that night. They spend the night because it's 20 to 25 miles back in the dark. So they spend the night, they come one day back, and then they spend another day walking around Jerusalem, still bustling with people. In fact, the Passover was uh, happened on one day. Then there was a seven-day feast uh, after that, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread that would happen after that. And I believe Mary and Joseph stayed the, the entirety of that. They were very faithful to that. But the place would still be bustling with people hanging around. So they've got to look under every stone to try to find Jesus. And finally, finally, they come to the temple, and this is where he is. And by the way, when verse 47 says, And all who heard him uh, as he's sitting among the teachers were amazed at his understanding, he's, there, he's not there learning uh, because he's already God. He's already has the mind of God. Well, I think what it means there, he's talking about that he's learning their law. He's learning their doctrine, the things that they have added to what God gave them into originally. And so I think he's trying to find out. He's searching to see where the leaders of the nation are spiritually, to see what kind of relationship they are in with God. And we know that they've already added 613 laws to what God gave them. And so I think that people are amazed at his answers uh, and, and the things that he's soaking up, listening. He's not there as a teacher. That's going to come later. He's there as a student, learning and, under, and, and, and understanding, asking relevant diagnostic questions. His lingering there, don't misunderstand his lingering for disobedience. It was not. His lingering was not irresponsibility either. There's no hint of that. His lingering was not even the fault of his parents. Uh, they had never known him to do anything wrong, uh, so they would not have expected him to do anything out of, except of complete obedience to them. They never known him to do anything that wasn't expected of him. So he's not acting irresponsible. It's not the fault of Mary and Joseph. He was obedient, he was sensitive, he was thoughtful, and I believe that he was respectful all the way up uh, through his entire life. But there is something going on here. There's something going on here, and it was a break. It was a breach. Jesus was moving from responsibility to earthly parents to responsibility to his heavenly Father. Let's see how this plays out in verse 48. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Now, there's been a, a, an occasion where we thought our kids were perhaps in one part of the house. And I go to look for them. Melissa says, no, they should have been there, right? And they're not there. And we begin to look, and in just, I mean, just a fraction of a second, your heart goes from resting to through the roof if you don't know where your kids are, right? Or your grandkids. You're like, I'm, I'm, their, I'm responsible for this. I'm under protection. Uh, I look out for them. And all of a sudden, I have no clue where they are, man. What kind of parent are you that loses your kid, you know? It, it, it's, you just completely lose it when you don't know where your kids are. So Mary says, son, why have you treated us so? Why have you done this? Then notice the next couple words. Behold, your father and I have been searching for you. How? In great distress. They're going around the city looking everywhere, hardly even opening the door, shut, you know, looking everywhere. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen our son? He might have been, I thought I saw him in the temple. They bolt over there. In, in, <clears throat> pardon me, it's not enough that Mary says, Son, why have you treated us? But you've got to know, you have caused us some great distress, some, some anxiety here. Now this is what I want to see. We have heard from the Old Testament prophets concerning that Jesus is going to be God. The Messiah is going to be here, and he is God. He is Lord. We've heard from the angels. You've heard this all your life from the angels. That he is Emmanuel, God with us. Mary and Joseph give testimony to account that this child is from God. He is from heaven, from Simeon, and from Anna. But now we hear from the boy, the child, Jesus, 12 years old himself. Verse 49. The crux of the whole passage. 
And I think this is where Luke was going when he started the letter to O Theophilus in chapter 1. Here's what he wants to tell them. And Jesus says to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Or your translation may say, I must be about my father's business. But isn't that what Mary just said to him? Right? Behold, your father and I. She didn't say we were looking for you. She specifically says your father. He flips that on his head because there's a breach in the responsibility to his parents and now to his heavenly father. What Jesus is saying here is there's a transition from submission as a boy and as a child at the age of 12 years old to complete just Mary and Joseph. The transition of submission as I enter into adulthood at the age of 13 is not so much my earthly parents, it's to my heavenly father. And he's saying, I am God. The boy Jesus is saying, this is my father's house. I'm about my father's business. And I am the son of God. Mary and Joseph, you're temporary. You're, a, you're temporary. I'm, I'm submitting to you in a temporary way. But there is, you knew this, Mary and Joseph. I think he, this is all wrapped up in the same. I was virgin conceived. I was virgin born. And you knew from the angel that the Messiah would be born. And I have come. And there's coming a time when I am going to be about my father's business. Now, he's been absolutely perfect in every way up to this point. And he remains absolutely perfect at this point, all the way through the end of his life. But this must be hard for us as humans and for you mothers out there, especially when you hear these words, where Jesus says, I'm not responsible to you anymore, Mary. And if you think that this is, this is extra biblical, I want to show you something. Look back, look over in Luke chapter 11. And while, while you're there in Luke chapter 2, look back in verse 22. Let me show you this first. Then we'll go to Luke chapter 11. I really want you to, to feel this. That scene... Just before we're told about this scene is Simeon and Anna blessing the Lord Jesus in the temple. But Simeon says something to Mary that I think is missed a lot of times. The fact that Mary was hurting was predicted. Look at verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary's mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising in many in Israel. Now listen, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Mary, he's come to be the savior of the world. He's not going to be your little boy forever. He's got a job. He's on a mission from who? God Almighty. He's on task. He's on a mission. And this is the beginning of the sword that's going to pierce Mary. Remember at the crucifixion at the cross, where do we find Mary? She's there at the cross. And the sword is being driven deeper and deeper into her soul. Why? Because the one that she carried, the one that she birthed, is hanging on a cross. Dying for the sins of the world. Feeling the whole wrath of God upon her. When did that start? In Luke. At 12 years old. When Jesus says, Mary and Joseph, you are my earthly parents, and I'm being submissive to you. And he would remain submissive. But there's another mission for me. And I've been on sent from God to do this mission. And it's become sin for the world because of the wages of sin is death. And he is the only one that's qualified to die because he's the sinless, perfect Lamb of God. And does this hurt Mary? Yes. But even Simeon said that this would hurt under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that a sword would pierce through her own soul. Then Luke, uh, Luke 11, 27. There's a scene in which Jesus is speaking, and, and this person just kind of lashes out and says these things about Mary to Jesus. <coughs> 
And he said, as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him. So this is a woman in the crowd speaking to Jesus, and this is what she says. Blessed is the womb that bore you in the breast at which you nursed. In other words, she's saying, how wonderful and blessed is Mary because she got to raise you. But Jesus' response in verse 28, but he said to her, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Meaning, meaning this, Mary is not to be elevated above anybody else simply because she gave birth to me. What's going to be, what the, the blessing for Mary is, as equal it is to the rest of the world, is that they obey me. That's how you receive the blessing, is by obeying me. It, and it's not the physical things of this world. It's eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. That's the blessing. And Jesus is saying this. She's not blessed because she bore me. She's blessed in the way that she obeys me. See, Mary went from raising a son to serving a Savior. And church, if I ask you this morning, what does Mary need more? Does she need a son or does she need a Savior? She needs a Savior. What do you and I need more out of the Christmas story? A story where Jesus just completely submits and always submits to Jesus, uh, to Mary and Joseph, or one that includes submitting also to Almighty God, going to the cross for you and for I. We need a Savior. Why? Because we're sinners. And we enter to this world sinners. We come into the world sinful because of the fall. And here we have the blessed Lamb of God as a 12-year-old boy seeing all that he saw in Jerusalem that day, the bleeding of the lamb, the 250,000 plus lambs that were slain, the blood running out the back of the temple, down to the brick pit drum, and he's seeing all that. He's seeing the blood sloshed on the altar, and he says, I'm not going to abort the mission. I'm on task. Everything's right on time. And he, let, he centers himself up under the sovereignty of God, under the lordship of Almighty God. He says, Mary and Joseph, this is a new day. And I'm here doing my father's business. This is day one. Now this would ultimately come to pass 18 years later. The time for implementing this would be 18 years later when he comes down to the River Jordan and he sees his cousin John the Baptist, old woman John the Baptist down there, baptizing people, the forerunner of Jesus. And John says, I, here comes the one that I'm telling you about. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Here he comes, the Lamb of God. Then verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. So as Mary and Joseph go back to Jerusalem, they find Jesus. They see what he's doing. Jesus tells them, I am here to do my father's business. I am in his house. And I'm on a mission from God. I want to make that abundantly clear. You've heard from everybody else, including yourselves. Do you remember who I am, Mary and Joseph, Mom and Dad? I'm here for the sin. I'm born to die. I'm here to do my father's business. But then he gathers his things up. And by the way, just kind of think about this the rest of the week. Where was he for the three days while he was there? Who did he stay with? What did he eat? How did the, how were things provided for him? I don't know. Doesn't tell us that. So those three days he was in Jerusalem. Now his parents come back, and he goes down with them. Everything is down from Jerusalem, even though uh, on a map he's going north, but because the Jerusalem is on the Temple Mount, he goes down and then back to Nazareth. Notice the next phrase. What does it say? And was submissive to them. Even though he made it abundantly clear to the entire world, including Mary and Joseph, that he's here to do his father's business, he for 18 more years, stayed submissive to Mary and Joseph. And I think they had a wonderful relationship. Why? Because of the next sentence. And she treasured up all these things in her heart. She treasured the time that she had with them. She treasured the time that she had with her son in her own home. Because on this day, she remembered, yes, he's mine for a while. But he's going to be gone one day. It's been prophesied of him. He continued 
being submissive for 18 years, to be subject willingly until he was 30 years old and began his public ministry. And then I still think that the love was so great. I think we see that it's evident in the, in the cross and the crucifixion where he says out when he's on the cross, he says to John, uh, behold your mother. Not his physical mother, but treat her like a mother because the son is leaving. Treat her like a mother, John. Then verse 52. That was the event that happened at 12 years old. Jesus claiming he's here to be on mission for his heavenly father, who he is God. Now, from age 12 to 30, here's what we got. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's all we've got. But this says a lot. He increased in wisdom, fully putting on the mind of God, fully understanding that he was God. He grew in stature, just like I think it speaks to the humanity, 100% humanity. It also speaks to the divinity of God. 100% God, 100% man. And in favor with God and man. He got some friends. He obtained some friends. He also gained a lot of enemies there too. But Mary had a lot of things about as we close this morning. Mary had a lot to think about. She had to realize that this son was to be thought of Savior. That she had to exchange authority for submission. That, you know, we don't necessarily do this in our culture today, but Mary was the authority in Jesus' life. Mary and Joseph were, both were. But at some point, this authority changes to submission. She's submissive to her own son. She had to exchange commanding, telling Jesus what to do, for obeying him. She had to exchange responsibility for redemption. She had to exchange wonder over the child for worship of the king. What about you and me? Do we remember that Jesus is not just a baby in the manger? When we think back as believers, there's more to the story. And I think we tell ourselves short. We tell When we tell other people that Jesus is a baby in the manger without telling them that he is Lord of lords and the king of kings. Yes, we worship the baby in the manger. We worship and we remember that fact. But this child became a boy who became a man who became the savior of the world. So when we look back to the Christmas story, let us, along with Mary, exchange our wonder for what happened and what we celebrate year after year. Let's ex let, let, let us exchange our wonder for the baby, for the worship of the king. So Christmas is over. Now what? We worship the king. And if it wasn't for the baby, there would be no king. He came for the sins of the world. Mary and Joseph's sin, shepherd's sins, wise men's sins, our sins, our family sins. So because of that, we can go and tell the message. We can proclaim the good news that there is a Savior, there's a Redeemer for your sins, and His name is Jesus. Let me tell you about Him. He was born in Bethlehem many years ago. But He grew up, and Jesus is none other than the Son of God. And that's the picture we have of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy understanding that and seeing that and being faithful and being fully committed to go to the cross, despising the shame,